Right. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm uh, very happy. Uh, many of you are still here. Uh, I welcome to the internet, uh, the uh, Ayuka uh, Summer School in Astronomy and Astrophysics, as well as the Terrestrial Course. That is now in its fourth week. We have another week to go after this. And we have in all um, almost 68 lectures. And you've um, gone past the halfway point. It's a very rainy morning here in Pune with uh, um, Cyclone Nisarga uh, approaching. And um, I'm very happy to be with you. So what I will do today is uh, 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 I will talk about galaxies, uh, particularly their groups. The and clusters. Um, at the end, I will talk about even larger structures, superclusters. Uh, when I did the first four lectures uh, in the first week, we talked about um, uh, a general introduction to the subject. We talked about how we measure distances in the universe, how uh, we know how large the universe is. And uh, at the time, say about 100 years ago, Think about 1920, when um, Eddington has just uh, gone and uh, shown that light bends around uh, the sun and uh, the first prediction of general relativity is correct. 1920 was the time when there was a famous debate in uh, the National Academy of Sciences in Washington, DC, between Harlow Shapley and Heber Curtis, where they debated how large the universe is. This is the centenary year of that debate. And uh, at that time, Shapley, who would then go and become um, probably the, the most famous observational astrophysicist of the last century, uh, was of the opinion that the whole universe is a galaxy and it's full of stars. And the universe is a few thousand parsecs across, maybe a million parsecs. Uh, Curtis, on the other hand, believed the universe is much, 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 much bigger. And actually, the universe is made up of island universes, and uh, we are one of those. It turns out that um, Curtis was right. And uh, in fact, Shapley soon realized his mistake. And in another 10 years or so, 1930 or so, it was Shapley who gave the name Galaxy to um, the, um, the, uh, the island universes that we live in, like uh, the Milky Way, which we live in. So I'm going to talk about, you have already heard about galaxies uh, previously from various other people, including uh, Kanak Saha, who talked about how galaxies uh, are shaped, what the morphology of the galaxies are, elliptical galaxies, spiral galaxies, and um, the dynamics of stars within these galaxies. Today, I'm going to talk about um, how galaxies evolve and mostly about galaxies, groups of galaxies, clusters of galaxies, larger structures, structures that galaxies make. Since galaxies were discovered less than 100 years ago, you can imagine that the subject of larger structures and um, and, and how they are distributed in the universe is even younger. In fact, most of the work in this subject was done during my lifetime as a student. Uh, and, and so even when I was an undergraduate in college in the 1980s, uh, much of this was not known. So you can see that this is a very, very young subject. And this is why it's very difficult to find textbooks which um, discuss these subjects. Uh, I will, uh, towards the end, um, talk about books and, and other resources that you can, uh, you can consult. You notice that in the previous slide, I used two pictures. On the left is a picture from uh, a simulation of dark matter, simulation of matter in the universe. It is a computer simulation. It's not a real picture, but it shows that in a realistic, and I'm going to come back to it many times <clears throat> during today and the next lecture. It shows that uh, in the uh, distribution of matter in the universe, this is matter, all this is matter particles. Um, not necessarily the matter that gives out light, which we call stars, 
but the matter underlying matter, which is dark matter. And you can see the, how it is distributed in the universe. And the Subramanium uh, had, has talked about large scale structure in the universe, how we characterize large scale structure, how structure forms in the universe. And we now know, you know, contrary to what we knew 50 years ago, um, when people thought the universe was um, uniformly distributed with matter, it's a nice soup of uh, uniformly distributed spherically symmetric isotropic uh, universe. We now know that it's on even very large scales, not the largest scales, but very large scales, very clumpy and filamentary. And uh, as you can see, the, the, that's why we call this the cosmic web. And you can see that if, if some of these clumps are galaxies and cluster galaxies, they are clustered. They are not uniformly distributed. On the right, you have a picture of uh, a, a cluster of galaxies. So we'll come back to these things. So uh, the, the first part of my, uh, my lecture essentially establishes that galaxies live in, when I say live, I don't mean they're alive objects, but they reside in groups and clusters. They don't like to be alone. I showed this slide in my introductory talk and you've come across various other um, talks in this series that has discussed this. Galaxies are of different kinds. You get these nice round ellipticals and Kanak Saha has told you how in the Hubble diagram, the tuning fog diagram, <clears throat> it was implied that the simplest galaxies are elliptical galaxies. And as uh, you go more and more complex, you see structure in the galaxies and uh, they show disky spiral structures. It is now actually uh, believed that galaxies form in these forms and ellipticals are not very um, you know, simple structures at all. They're very complex. They're also old. They come from um, spiral galaxies or young galaxies which star form, which are forming stars, that they evolve into these large structures <coughs> of, um, of elliptical uh, large galaxies, uh, which, um, uh, which actually are very old. They have old populations. They don't have young stars. And the Hubble uh, tuning fork diagram has uh, now um, has now a very new meaning, which I, in, in Dr. Saha's first lecture, he established. <clears throat> now, as I said, galaxies um, don't like to live alone. They um, interact with each other. They collide with each other. They they merge with each other. With each other. Stars don't do that within galaxies. Stars are very far apart. Stars are small objects. Um, with very compact um, sizes, and the distance between them is very large compared to their sizes. Galaxies, on the other hand, are extended objects. They have 10 to the power 9, 10, 11, 12 stars, and, um, and they're extended objects, and the distance between them uh, is not as large compared to the sizes of the galaxies. As a result, as the galaxies move around in the universe, they uh, interact with uh, each other quite a bit, as you can see. And, um, and, and so, and then they form units, which are called groups. For example, our local neighborhood, and I briefly alluded to this in my introductory talk, um, we, our own galaxy, which we call the Milky Way, which is portrayed here in this nice artist's impression. And we have a bunch of satellite galaxies around us. A few are shown here. We know of more than 40 or so of them. Um, and um, we live in a small group. We call it the local group, the local group, for want of a better name. It's not a very imaginative name. And, um, and, and this local group has another largish galaxy near us, the Andromeda galaxy. Here in Ayuka, um, we have the housing colony where we live. We call it Akash Ganga, which is the Sanskrit name of the Milky Way. The place where we work, our office, we call Deviani, which is the name of the Andromeda galaxy. So we, we live in a local group here. This, this local group, um, the Andromeda galaxy also has lots of these satellite galaxies around them and we are falling towards each other. And together we make a small group with two very large galaxies, a couple of middle-sized galaxies like N33 and, and, um, and IC10 and things like that. 
and lots of tiny little galaxies which are satellite galaxies. So that's an example of a very small, but a uh, very small unit, which is kind of a typical unit in the universe, as we will see. And coming back to this plot, then it's a simulation. We show that <clears throat> this is a large scale structure. Now here, the size of this across is that that bar tells you it's about more than 100 mega parsecs. Remember, the distance between two galaxies roughly is about a mega parsec, a million parsecs. And so this is about more than 100. So you can see then these units of matter, the small units, the dots that you see would be galaxies. And in fact, if you look at these systems in this, you will find that something like this we would call a cluster where there will be hundreds of these little galaxies and maybe a little small system like this we would call a group which will have a few galaxies. I mean, this could be us and Andromeda with our little satellites around, right, in this simulation. And, and all on these filaments all over, you see these are little groups, group, 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 cluster. That would be a big cluster coming up down there and things like that. So that's, that's how um, we define groups and clusters. And later on towards the end of the next lecture, I will say how a system like this, which consists of clusters connected by lots of filaments on the web might be called a supercluster because it, we now have discovered that there's a lot of interaction even across the cosmic web between clusters, not just galaxies interacting with each other, but clusters interacting with each other. So they have, um, there's a lot of action going on in the universe. The universe is not a dead place, even in terms of um, in stars. So here's a good example of a very, very rich cluster of galaxies. Uh, it's a Hubble Space Telescope picture, a lovely, wonderful picture. You have also seen pictures of clusters such as this um, in Dr. More, Surud More and Anuprita More's talks on gravitational lensing. This is a lensing cluster. You can see lots of lensing arcs and then I'll talk briefly about it later on, but you can see that this is full of these reddish elliptical galaxies. And this particular cluster has more than a thousand galaxies, major galaxies. Remember our, old, our own local group has two galaxies, big galaxies. Um, 1689 would have many hundred big galaxies as big as our own galaxy. And so clusters can be really dense, big, large systems. They are the big cities of the universe. If you think of life on Earth and uh, the small villages are the small groups, right? That's that's the kind of, and there are many roads connecting them, highways connecting them, motorways connecting them, in which galaxies travel. That those are the filaments of the cosmic web. That's a kind of rough analogy. It's not a very good analogy, but it's a rough rough analogy, right? So here are examples of these galaxy groups. And I'll be talking um, about clusters, groups, superclusters, etc. But it's important for you to be familiar with uh, these things. Now, these are modern, very modern. All of these taken within the last 10 years or so, pictures of two different groups. So here's a, a picture on the left of the Whirlpool Galaxy, M51, which is very similar to our own Milky Way. And you can see that it has a small galaxy next to it called M52. And if you look at a very deep picture, and this is a picture that is um, a, a, very, a very deep picture taken from, with many filters and combined together uh, um, from um, uh, Earth, a very deep picture taken for many years, uh, slowly built up and superposed. You can see that not only are these two galaxies connected, they are, um, actually interacting with each other. We call this galaxy harassment. It is a, a, a kind of um, um, anthropocentric, anthropomorphic term. Of course, galaxies don't harass each other, humans do. But um, here it's harassment because it's a large galaxy that's kind of pulling out stars from the small galaxy. And you can see all these in a deep image. These are all stars. They're spread all over the place. And this is because stars are being pulled out of a galaxy by a big galaxy, just with the force of gravitation. And uh, as a result, and, and this galaxy is actually going around this galaxy. And as a result, uh, while this, this small galaxy is being torn, it's being torn apart 
by the big galaxy and the stars are coming out. And soon, um, soon meaning um, hundreds of millions of years, uh, even billions of years, these two galaxies will merge with each other. This will fall in here and be become part of this galaxy. So all this action is happening out there. And we have to understand um, why this happens, how this happens, and what this means for the evolution of stars and galaxies in the universe, eventually leading up to you know, the formation of solar systems around stars and us. But first these galaxies formed, stars in them formed, and then, and then uh, we formed in our own galaxy. And so to reconstruct the whole universe's history, we have to understand this. Remember on these large scales, only gravitation matters, but gravitation is pretty complicated because um, even though between two objects, it's a very simple formula, GMM over R squared, you must have uh, listened to various talks in this series, including Dr. Saha's talk, in which you realize that there are more than two objects in each system. And so the dynamics becomes very, very complex. A good example is on the right, which is uh, called the Stefan's Quintet. It's actually five galaxies. It turns out that this particular galaxy is not part of this system. It's just in front. And there are four galaxies in there. This is part of my work, for example, uh, my own collaborators, where we did some very deep observations of this system with the Hubble Space Telescope observations. The blue um, stuff in the middle you see is the hot gas that we detected from the Chandra satellite. It just shows as as these galaxies are coming together and, and merging with each other, bumping into each other, there is hot hydrogen gas in between. And this is megaparsecs across. They get very heated as a result of the kinetic energy of this collision and heated to 10 to the power seven degrees emitting X-rays. And so um, there's a lot of energetic phenomenon, uh, phenomena that are happening in these groups of galaxies. And this is a tiny group of galaxies, but um, there's a lot of action going on, even in these tiny groups of galaxies. So the groups, the message that I want you to take away from here is that the groups and, and, and um, uh, the clusters of galaxies, the villages and the cities of galaxies have a lot going on that are not related to what's happening in the galaxies. If you think of, galaxies being the individual houses where there's a lot of politics, a lot of interaction, a lot of um, uh, you know, um, relation between the various people who live within the galaxy. So there's the stars and the gas and the dust that's within the galaxy. But there's a lot of action going on in these systems that is in between the galaxies, in these groups and in the clusters and in between these groups and clusters. So outside the galaxies, we talked about galaxies being the island universes. They are the basic building blocks of the universe, like the molecules. But they are not islands in the sense that they don't interact with each other. They interact with each other. And when they're dense systems, like groups and clusters, there's a lot of stuff going on. So um, just to put uh, it, all this into perspective in terms of scale, uh, we find that these galaxy groups, clusters, and, and, uh, and galaxy groups and clusters, they themselves have um, a hierarchy. They are small to large. And the universe's clustering is hierarchical, as uh, Professor Kandaswamy Subramanian talked about. And you've had cosmology lectures where hierarchy has been mentioned. And um, so you can see that if you look at um, the, um, the you, you can just look at it in one way. I mean, just look at, for example, here, the, uh, we're looking at um, the hot gas that is in, the, uh, in these systems that emit X-rays. Just take one parameter. I'm going to talk about more of the others very soon. And you can see that if you just take the hot gas that is in between these stars in the galaxy, in the, in, the soup, in the group, so that's a galaxy, that's a group, that's a cluster. And you can, you can see in between the stars and in between the galaxies, there's hot gas. And this system, the hot gas itself scales up. So for example, if you take the temperature of the hot gas in a galaxy, it's about, and I, I, I write the temperature in kilo electron volts, and that is KT, which is the energy. 
you can divide that by the Boltzmann constant and you get the temperature, one kilo electron volt in temperature is 10 to the power seven degrees Kelvin. So um, you can see that in bit and, and, and the, the temperature of the gas scales at the mass, you will see later, we will, we're gonna talk about that. And so as the galaxy and the groups are larger than the galaxy and the clusters are larger than the groups, you can see that the temperature of the gas in these systems increase with um, the size, the scale. And I'll come back to this when I talk about extra observations. So here's a very, very complicated plot. And I want you to not to look at this, but look at this plot. And I'm gonna spend some time talking about why um, I, I insist on talking about galaxy groups, even though they're boring little systems with uh, you know, two or three, four galaxies, as opposed to these mega clusters, which everybody talks about hundreds and thousands of, of galaxies. And, 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 and that is because of the following reason. The left-hand plot is, as I said, a complicated plot, but it shows on the y-axis the fraction of stars in the universe in various systems. So you say, you have a small system, a large system, and a large system, and a large system. And on the x-axis is the size of the system, in this particular case, in, in logarithm of the light that comes out of that system, which is a proxy of the mass of the system, right? So it is like, for example, if you are saying, let's find out what fraction of um, people in this country live in villages or cities or towns which have a thousand people, 10,000 people, 100,000 people, million people, right? And so this is what we are saying. We're saying, what is the fraction of stars in the universe that lie in systems that have 10 to the power nine times the light of the sun, 10 times the light of 10 to the 10 times the light of the sun, 10 to the 11 times light of the sun. So these are, so as our galaxy, for example, has 10 to the power 10 times the light of the sun. That is our own galaxy. So if this is a, a graph that tells you that um, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, that is the percentage. So it tells you that if you look at systems that are greater than 10 to the power 12 times the light of the sun, that these are the rich clusters like I showed, those have 10 to the power 12 stars um, because there are, each galaxy has 10 to the power 10, 10 to the 11 stars and those have 10, 11, uh, hundred thousands of galaxies. So they have more than 10 to the power 12 stars. You can see that the fraction is very tiny. It's less than 5% of all stars in the universe, which means it is 10 less than 5% of all the mass of the universe. So this graph is telling you, it's a very potent graph. It's telling you that clusters are very nice to look at. They're lovely systems and a lot of people study them, but they contain less than 5% of all the galaxies or stars in the universe, whereas most of the matter in the universe, the stars and, stars and galaxies in the universe, lie in systems that are 10 to the power 10 and a half, 10 to the power 11 times the light of the sun, which is the size of our local group, our own group. So for example, if you are studying history and you study the history of only kings and queens, the really rich people, then of course you can study history, but you won't know anything about what the people do, right? You, 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 you read the political history and that's how we are taught history. But actually, if you want to know the history of the world, you have to study the lifetimes, the life stories of the people. You have to know how people live, what they eat, etc. And if you want to do that, then you have to study small collections of people, people who live in villages, people who are the common people. The common people are here. The common galaxies are here, right? So groups, these are small groups 
groups are where most of the galaxy evolution takes place. Most of the galaxies spend their lifetime in groups and only towards the end of their life as they travel down those cosmic highways of the cosmic web, they end up in these large systems called clusters when most of their life is over and they're red and dead. So it is important to know what galaxy groups do. And uh, that is why I'm gonna talk about galaxy groups alongside galaxy clusters. I won't talk about much of them because you know, this is a very, very new subject. People have only realized that most galaxies live in groups in the last 20, 25 years. And people have been studying this. So if you, for example, any of you want to do astrophysics, come into subjects like I'm describing, these are things you'll be working on because this is the subject of the future to study the real history of the universe, of how the universe uh, evolves. What are clusters and groups of galaxies made of mostly? They are made of um, galaxies, of course, and these galaxies have stars in them. We've talked about what galaxies are made of. Galaxies have stars in them, they have dust, they have gas. Uh, they have dark matter, individual galaxies, right? But I said, you know, you've already had lectures on galaxies. I'm going to talk about the groups and clusters. So these groups and clusters are made up of galaxies. They're also made up of stars that are not, but they don't belong to galaxies. They're in between the galaxies, intergalactic stars. And these are made up of baryons. By baryons, of course, by now you know what I mean. Baryons are particles that are made up of quarks. So it's protons and neutrons. And that's what we are made of. So galaxies are mostly made of baryons. There's a little bit of dark matter, which is non-baryonic. But stars, intergalactic stars are also baryons. And then more importantly, very importantly, in fact, in between the galaxies in a cluster group, you have the gas. And it could be cold gas, um, tens of degrees, hundreds of degrees. It could be medium cold gas, thousands of degrees. Or it could be really hot gas. And that is 10 to the power 6, 10 to the power 7 degrees. The really cold gas emits uh, radio waves. The medium cold gas emits all kinds of, uh, if you look at black body radiation, emits uh, um, very faint light and UV, which we don't detect. And the really hot gas emits X-rays, which we detect. And then the whole cluster or the whole group is embedded in large halos of dark matter. And this dark matter is, um, is non-baryonic. It is not made up of protons and neutrons and quarks and even leptons. These are made up of things that we don't, um, haven't detected yet, but we can feel their presence through gravitation. Okay. So these are the constituents of these. And so I'm going to talk about in the next few parts, talk about what these things are. So let's look at the baryons in these clusters and groups. If you look at in, in, um, in, in the whole universe, uh, you've already come across this, um, this quantity called omega. And omega is the density of any volume of the universe, yeah, uh, scaled by what is known as omega naught, omega zero, and that is the omega, the density that's required for a flat universe, matter-dominated flat universe, which we know the universe is not. But if the universe was just full of matter, and it was uh, a flat universe um, from the time we sitter, then that would be omega naught. So that's just a ratio just to tell you what kind of, um, and, and we know that from the Planck satellite, uh, from the cosmic microwave background studies now, that the density of baryons, and these are the density of quarks, the protons and the neutrons and the us, and these baryons in the universe is a, a fraction that is about 2%, 2.2%. Modulo this quantity H, and H we know is about 68%, something like that. And that's the uh, parameterized Hubble parameter. 
if the Hubble constant, which is the expansion of the universe, is 67, 68 kilometers per second per megaparsec, it is expressed as 0.67, and you put that in there. And so this, so actually, if this is 0.67, then the square of that divide will divide this particular quantity, and the, um, the a baryon density will become something like three to four percent. Right. So baryons, which are us, what we are made of, the stars are made of, and the planets are made of, are a very small fraction of the matter in the universe. Right. You can see it's less than five percent of the universe. And even if you take the matter density of the universe, Planck also gives us a study of dark energy and dark matter, which Bernsani is going to cover um, next week uh, in great detail. We know that the universe um, uh, is not, not matter dominated at all. And the baryons, even if you take the fraction of the total matter in the universe, it's less than 20%. And uh, the... Um, and the rest is non-baryonic, which is the dark matter. Now, if you take this uh, particular um, number and you do the census, and a lot of people are doing this now, this is all work done in the last maybe 10, 15 years, where people have gone and looked at how many stars there are in these galaxies that we see around us. You don't have to go and count every single star. It's a very boring job. What you do is you look at the uh, number of stars at different masses in different kinds of galaxies, and you build models to uh, you know, um, extrapolate for them. Uh, and then you, you say there are so many galaxies of so much mass uh, distributed all through the universe. We know the volume of the universe. And, and, then, uh, and then you multiply that by the mass of the star, and you figure out how many stars there would be in the universe that accounts for 0.3% uh, of the baryons. Then you look at the neutral gas, and this is the really cold gas. Neutral gas, by neutral gas, I mean atomic hydrogen, mostly atomic gas. And, and this is the gas that has a temperature of uh, maybe 50, maybe 100 um, Kelvin, cold gas that lies in between the stars in the galaxy. And, and that's, we, we know how much there is. And that's your, um, uh, you know, even less. Then we have the molecular gas, which is, um, say, H2 or CO2, CO, um, all kinds of, and, and we are now discovering all kinds of molecules, organic molecules um, in, in various systems. This is the molecular gas also at a temperature of hundreds of degrees. And uh, with now with the ALMA telescope, we are discovering very complex molecules as well. You have already heard that stars are formed from molecular gas clouds. That's where stars form. They are cold enough that stars can collapse and form. So our star also formed from a cloud of molecular gas. Molecular gas is very important. Its incidence in galaxies is even smaller, very tiny fraction of all the gas that you find in galaxies and in between galaxies in the clusters is very tiny. They're very vital in our formation, formation of planets and stars, but they're very small. And the hot intergalactic gas that is in between, which is 10 to the power 6, 10 to the power 7 degrees hot, that is almost 0.2%. You note that the amount of the density of, or the total amount of gas in the hot phase is more than the amount of matter in the stars and planets and us, right? So if you look at just the baryons in the universe made up of quarks, protons and neutrons, then predominantly it is in the hot phase in between galaxies in groups and clusters, more than the mass that's in the stars. If we add all this up, we still find that a lot of the baryons in the universe are un unaccounted for even now. It's one of the biggest um, puzzles in astronomy right now. Where are the missing baryons? Where are the rest of the baryons? We know that's there because Big Bang cosmology tells us so many baryons were created. We know the number of quarks that were created in the, in the universe. We can see their signatures everywhere in various things, um, but we, 
have not been able to find all of them. Right, very nice. Because this is a, a great thing about a young subject. We are learning, we are finding out about the universe. Very, very, very young subject. We are at a very early stage. <clears throat> One clue comes from this amazing work that is being done with very small telescopes. Here's work done by Chris Mijos and his collaborators with a tiny telescope, a 40 inch telescope in Arizona, uh, which I have observed with many, many, many times in my life. Um, it's a Schmidt telescope for, um, we used to work uh, on various things this um, long, long time ago. And then a small university in the, in the US case, Western Reserve, uh, actually bought the telescope and converted it into a dedicated telescope that will look only at the Virgo cluster of galaxies. This is the nearest galaxy cluster to us. And so this particular telescope for the last 15 years or so, has only looked at this particular galaxy cluster every night when it's been clear and has built up this very deep image over the years, day in, day out. All the students working with this telescope is taking pictures, 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 pictures every night, adding them up, adding them up. And this is the deepest optical picture that we know of taken from the Earth right now by a telescope of any single object. And if you see this particular cluster shows that there are all these galaxies that we all know about. This is M87, the famous galaxy in the center of the Virgo cluster in which we discovered that wonderful donut shaped black hole last year that came in, the, uh, in all the papers. That is um, the M87 things. But interesting thing is that you see that in a cluster of galaxies, all these are stars in between all these galaxies. It's just full of stars and it's, they are all pulling each other's stars out, which we didn't know about really. If you look at a nice picture of um, a cluster of galaxies, you see all these galaxies there. We don't, didn't know that they're all uh, through their mutual gravitation pulling things out of each other. And so there are a lot of stars unaccounted for. Some of it could be the missing baryon we were talking about. They are uh, spread all over the place. So there are these intergalactic stars that is a subject that is completely unexplored. Only few PhD theses are now coming out of studying the intergalactic star streams. They pull them up in, in streams, as you can see. Small galaxies are being disrupted by large galaxies. They're being broken up into star streams. And then you have the neutral hydrogen. The neutral hydrogen is, um, is, is the cold gas that lies in the galaxy. And often you can see them far bigger than, spread far bigger than um, the galaxies themselves. Here are two examples of the neutral hydrogen that you see them. These you, these you see by radio telescopes. You've already heard um, uh, from the introduction to radio astronomy, a uh, little introduction that you, you, you and you get more uh, Nido Jupiter's talk and Avinash Deshpande's talks coming up, where you see that the radio telescopes um, at a frequency of 1.4 gigahertz um, detect um, a spin flip transition of atomic hydrogen, um, which uh, has a wavelength of 21 centimeters. And this shows that hydrogen, of course, is the most abundant element in the universe. And the cold gas, the gas in the atomic form, actually shows this, um, this transition. And so by radio telescopes, you can map the same galaxies. And here you can see here, the negative picture that you can see in both these, these are two different galaxies. The negative picture you see is, um, is uh, um, um, a galaxy's optical picture. So these are the stars. And in negative, you can see that uh, the black parts are the stars. And the galaxy, you would have, if you just looked at the optical picture, you would have seen the galaxy ended there. But then if you look in a radio telescope, you see so much bigger the galaxy is. And it's just the neutral hydrogen, which has a temperature of uh, tens or hundreds of degrees of Kelvin, which is spread all over. And that's why it's in the atomic form. If it were any, um, any, any higher, it would be ionized. So this is atomic, atomic hydrogen, mostly, and uh, other, um, other atoms of other elements, but mostly hydrogen. 
spread all over. So this is the neutral. So if you remember, I showed you a budget of all the baryons. So that's the neutral gas, that bit. This is the neutral hydrogen emitting radio waves that's in the galaxy, that's spread all over the galaxy. And you can see this, for example, if you look at M81 on the right-hand side, uh, here it was mixed up between the two put on top of each other. Here we separated it. And you can see here's M81 and M82, just like the M51 picture. If you just looked at the normal optical picture and you look at the stars, you would think that these two galaxies are not connected with each other. This actually is a small galaxy that orbits M81. M81. If you look in it's the same scale, but if you look in a radio, um, and the line emission uh, of the 21 centimeter line, you're looking at the, um, the neutral hydrogen you can see how much neutron hydrogen there is and how much these three galaxies, this tiny galaxy here as well, is a small group of galaxies. All of them are pulling out this cold gas out of each other and streams, they're interacting. All this stuff you can see in the cold gas. So this picture is boring. It doesn't tell you anything what's happening in there. Once you look at the cold gas, you see what's happening in there. Right, and you, you know what, uh, what's going on and what these galaxies are made of. You wouldn't even notice that there are these blobs of gas that are out there. There are no galaxies or stars here corresponding to these. And this one has really been disrupted, as you can see, by these streams of gas coming out. That tells us how galaxies evolve, how galaxies, um, galaxies change as their um, lifetime changes. As, as, as they go through their lives. Um, and this gives us very important clues, just looking at normal pictures of, the, of, the, um, of these galaxies tell us nothing. And then you have to look at the hot gas. So if you remember again, I, I go back to this picture, we talked about the stars and we noticed that there are stars in between the galaxies and they're pulling each other out, the stars. They're pulling out the neutral gas also as they interact. In a, in a cluster or in a group, small groups. I, I haven't shown you the molecular gas, but I'm talking of the hot intergalactic gas, the really hot gas. And we'll talk about why it becomes so hot, but here's the hot gas. And this, these are um, X-rays um, um, that are um, um, taken um, images from the Chandra X-ray telescope. And here uh, on the left is a, a picture of a very rich cluster of galaxies, Abel 1689. Uh, where the Hubble Space Telescope picture is there. These are the galaxies. And on top of, in purple, has been superposed the X-ray image taken by the Chandra Telescope. So remember, all of these galaxies that you see here, like the galaxy you saw in this, these are normal stars. These are a few thousand degrees hot. Like our sun is 6,000 degrees hot. They emit light. So these emit light. But where there is purple in between the galaxies in here, this is 10 to the power seven degrees hot. 10 to the power three degrees hot here, all these galaxies. These galaxies are 10 to the power three degrees hot. The purple stuff is 10 to the power seven degrees hot. And this is the gas that lies in between the galaxies in this cluster. What is holding it together? You can come to that and that's the dark matter halo. The gravitational um, potential of the dark matter holds together all this together. The, the, the galaxies, cold gas, and the hot gas. On the right, Abel 2125, another of these rich clusters. Here, I've taken out all the galaxies. This is only the hot gas. And you can see that this is everything in this picture is more than 10 to the power 7 degrees hot. And it's all baryons very, very hot. And the galaxies would be embedded just like here in these. And if you look at this, you will see that, and, and, the, and the scale of this is many megaparsecs, right? Because these are clusters. Remember the distance between, typical distance between galaxies are of the order of many, so many, many megaparsecs large. And, and, and so, and, and then, um, and this is just hot gas. So over, tens of millions of light years in this particular volume, 
you have a huge amount of podcasts. So just to just to summarize again, all these different components, what what the clusters are made of. But the the, the thing that is holding it together, the predominant component of the, the clusters, which is essentially putting it all together, is the dark matter. Otherwise, these things won't be together. The gravitation of the galaxies themselves, not enough to create this amazing amount of hot gas in between the gravitational potential energy of the galaxies themselves is not enough to, um, to heat this gas up to these temperatures that we're thinking about. And for most of these galaxies and clusters, the gravitational potential of the galaxies themselves is not enough to keep these groups, these systems together. So the next part I'm going to talk about is, is the role the dark matter plays and how we find the dark matter. Now, you've already heard of a little bit of dark matter in the last few um, uh, weeks of lectures. You know that uh, the largest fraction of matter in the universe is, is in the form of dark matter. We, we've never detected them. We've only detected their presence through, um, uh, through their gravitation. And here you'll see how. So in order, I'm going to start this, I might not finish it today in terms of, um, in terms of uh, telling you what, how, to, how to measure the dark matter in the, in the, in the universe, but let me just um, go through this. And you've already encountered, I'm sure, um, in um, various lectures in this, in this course, in, this, uh, uh, in the last three weeks, the Virial Theorem. It comes from classical mechanics. Um, Many people in their uh, MSc advanced classical mechanics learn about the Virial theorem. It is a, a simple tool that's used in, um, in, in astrophysics because we deal with uh, many particle systems, which are complex systems. So we have to um, deal with not individual particles, but quantities um, which are related to their energy um, and time averaged um, uh, quantities. So in the Virial theorem, uh, you know that if you take a system, which is a gravitating system that is held together, the time averaged total kinetic energy, which is called T here, and the time averaged and averaged over a large, a large amount of time, millions of years, the time, uh, the time averaged potential energy the gravitational potential energy, V, is related to um, each other by this relation 2T plus V is equal to this left-hand side, which is the double derivative of the moment of inertia of the system. And if the moment of inertia of the system is not changing over this period of time we are talking about, i.e. the system is in equilibrium, this can be considered to be zero. So 2t plus v equals zero is a simple equation that we use quite a lot. In, in, uh, and so if, if the system is expanding or contracting, then this is not zero. So this, uh, this uh, Virial theorem in its most popular form, which says 2t plus v equals zero, does not apply to systems that are still collapsing. A lot of galaxies are coming together to form a cluster or it's still expanding. But, um, but what happens is, if, if they are in some form of equilibrium, then we can call it 2t plus v equals 0, right? So what is t and what is v? t is uh, the, um, the total kinetic energy in everything in the system. So you have a thousand particles like galaxies whizzing around, each with a velocity vi, each with a mass mi. Then it's just the half mv squared of each of these particles um, summed up together. Now, and then you take pairs of each of these particles, of these thousands of particles or systems, and you, um, you calculate the gravitational potential energy due to each one of them, and that's GMM over R, uh, with the indices uh, referring to individual galaxies. And it, there'll be a minus sign because um, it's, it's negative gravitational potential energy. You have to work on it to 
bring them apart, and that's why they're negative. Um, and so it's the sum of G and M over R, right? So that's your V, that's your T, and then in, a, in some kind of an equilibrium, 2G plus V is equal to zero. And once you know that, for example, for a single spherical object, this uh, most physics students would have done right at the beginning in their class, some people would have even done this in their class two, class 11 and 12, where they're just about learning integral calculus. They would know how to take the, um, a sphere, a gravitating sphere, break it up into shells, each one a shell with a, a thickness dr and an average density rho r, and the mass of the shell will be four pi r squared rho dr. And then you, you figure out what is the potential energy that you need to assemble this particular sphere in shells, starting from a small little sphere and then building it up into shells around it by bringing the mass away from, uh, from infinity there. And, and you do this, this is done in almost all books. And of course, I'll give you the slides so you can look at this. You, you do this and what you do is you integrate over um, from bringing the thing from infinity where the gravitational potential energy is zero to uh, a particular radius r. And then you know that the gravitational potential energy of a particular sphere is minus three fifths gm squared over r. Right. And, um, and so, and then I've already told you what the kinetic energy is. Kinetic energy of all the galaxies moving around in this cluster is um, half mv squared. And the potential energy would be this, this quantity, which for a spherical object, if you just think of the cluster as a spherical object, will be, if you have the mass of the cluster, would be minus 350 m squared over r. So um, the last thing I will say today, and I'll pick this up tomorrow, was that this is how the existence of dark matter in the universe was first found and predicted from clusters of galaxies. See, I told you that we knew about galaxies in the 1920s and 1930s first, and very soon we realized that galaxies live in clusters. And so this man, very funny looking man, but a very, very important astronomer of the last century, Fritz Zwicky, who's a professor at Caltech, um, in, in the early 30s, very soon after galaxies were discovered, um, looked at the Virgo cluster and the Coma cluster, the two nearest clusters. Here's a picture of uh, the Coma cluster. And he applied this virial theorem in exactly the way I, I told you. He took some of these velocities. Hubble was measuring the radial velocities of these um, galaxies. So he knew how fast these galaxies are moving. And I'm going to do this in greater detail uh, on Thursday of how he did it. But he applied this particular argument that I just talked about. Uh, he calculated the, um, the, the total potential energy of the coma cluster from that minus three fifths gm squared over r. He calculated the total um, kinetic energy of the galaxies from the few galaxies for which the, um, uh, the, the velocities were measured. And by making some educated guesses, he found the total mass of this cluster. And he found that if you took the individual galaxies and converted them into their corresponding masses, the total cluster had um, at least 10 times, if not more, maybe even 50 or 100 times more mass than the masses of the galaxies put together. And so he, in 1933, said, there must be a lot of mass in between all these galaxies that we are not seeing, that it doesn't have any light associated with it, and he called it dark matter, which, of course, is one of these predictions that, um, I mean, we give Nostradamus a lot of um, credit. We give astrologers a lot of credit for predictions they make without any, any absolutely any scientific basis whatsoever. It's a simple calculation that Fritz Wicke did, and he predicted something that only now we are figuring out how important it is. So dark matter then makes up 
clusters and groups their major the major part of their matter and and in between um, in this this huge halos of dark matter which clusters are, and galaxies are and groups are are galaxies hot gas cold gas and stars in between the galaxies they make up these groups and clusters and i'm going to come back uh, on thursday to talk more about how these galaxies and the various different components work with each other in the way these things evolve in the universe. Okay, I'll stop there today and I'll look at what kind of questions you have. Um, I see um, the, the, in, in the chat box there are a lot of questions, but what I would like you is to, um, is to raise your hand and um, ask questions and uh, I will uh, unmute you. And you don't have to turn on your video, you can turn only your audio and you can ask, um, ask questions, okay? I can, uh, in the chat box, there are many questions um, already being asked. Um, so um, one of the earliest questions uh, has been asked by Junik uh, Sengupta. Can you um, ask your question? Yeah. Good morning, sir. May I ask you? Yes, go ahead. I can hear you. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, actually, um, uh, perhaps I got more than one question. Should I be sticking to only one of them? Please stick to one. There are many. You can come back to come back to your next question uh, if that all, all the others are done. Okay. Definitely, definitely. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Uh, so my first question was that uh, since those clusters, as you have defined, they are not very. Uh, those clusters are not very. Like they're they're small in number as compared to the number of groups. So are they very uniformly or symmetrically placed all over the web? No, they are all. Uh, we talked about hierarchical clustering. Um, you know, Kanda Swami Subramanian would have talked about this as well. Um, galaxies uh, are built up in systems hierarchically. So the, the clusters are not uniformly distributed. They're also clustered. And I'll talk about superclusters later on. So galaxies are clustered in groups and clusters. Clusters are clustered in, in small groups and, and, and small cluster groups and larger cluster groups. So if you look at the, the weight, yeah. the way the, um, the clusters are uh, distributed all over the universe, you will see that uh, there is clustering on all scales. There is uh, no uniformity in, in the distribution of these clusters. Does that answer your question? Actually, there's a second part. Actually, the, um, the point right. is that uh, since the, those clusters are not uniformly distributed, aren't they effective? the homogeneity of the cosmic wave of course they are the cosmic wave is not homogeneity well homogeneous at all where do you see homogeneous if you look at what the cosmic web looks like um, um this picture here does it look homogeneous to you not at all the universe is homogeneous on a very very large scale this is only 100 megaparsecs across the universe is many tens of gigaparsecs across if you look at the um, if you look at the universe on a gigaparsec scale, or maybe a hundred megaparsec, or not hundred, but thousand, close to a thousand, which is gigaparsec scale, half of that, or something like that, that kind of scale, the universe is homogeneous because it is very hard to have structure build up in the age of the universe on that scale. But on the scale of a hundred megaparsecs, as you see here, this box is a hundred megaparsecs across. Would you call this homogeneous? I would not. I mean, this looks like, I don't know, uh, you know, um, any, any part of a spider web. So there's a lot of structure on this. Structure. That's the whole point. And this, if you read books that are more than 30 years old, they did not know about these things. The cosmic wave has been discovered in my lifetime. In fact, I discovered the Shapley supercluster, which is the largest cluster, uh, the, the structure during my PhD days. So this was in the 1990s, 80s. So um, before that, these things were not known. So if, if you're reading cosmology astrophysics books much older than that, they would say the universe is completely homogeneous and isotropic on all scales. They didn't know anything. In fact, even when Stephen Hawking is writing his famous book called The Brief History of Time, he knew nothing about it. So I think what is happening now is that our whole view of the large scale structure of the universe is changing very fast. Anyway, let's go to the next um, um, question. Uh, Himadri um, Shaha. 
Uh, I'm unmuting you. Please ask your question. Himadri, are you still there? Okay, uh, I, Himadri is having problem uh, un, uh, unmuting. I tried to unmute you. Hello, sir. Yes, go ahead, Himadri. Your question. Yes, sir, uh, we actually showed a map where the neutral hydrogen gas uh, actually extends quite larger than the visible part. So my question is that in those regions, are there are molecular clouds too? Because if there were molecular clouds, then there would be star forming regions. Very so, good question. I, so I didn't show you, I will tomorrow or not tomorrow, the after, I'll show you where the molecular clouds are. The neutral hydrogen, as you saw, is very uniformly distributed um, all through the galaxy. And even um, it's much larger than the galaxy, the stars itself. And that is because the neutral hydrogen has been there and formed that uh, in certain regions, the stars have formed. The stars have formed predominantly where gas is even colder and where molecules can exist. Where atomic gas is, there, uh, gas, the, the, the molecules have been split into atoms. It's slightly warmer. These molecular clouds exist actually in not all through the galaxy, but in certain kinds of galaxies in certain environments. For example, you saw in Konakshaha's lectures, that in the spiral structure of the galaxies, the flat galaxies, the spiral galaxies like us, you have these clouds of molecular gas and that's where stars are forming. Actually, if you look at a galaxy and you see stars forming, blue stars in regions, those are the places where molecular clouds are. In elliptical galaxies, there are very few molecular clouds, not much molecular gas at all, because all the molecular gas, because elliptical gas is very old, and all the molecular gas has turned into stars. And, and so there is very little star formation in elliptical galaxies. So molecular gas is not distributed very uniformly in the universe at all. And they are some of the most interesting components of these galaxies. Okay, right. Let's Thank look you, at sir. other questions. I mean, uh, please raise your hand if you had any other questions. I can see, for example, um, Arjun Da asking questions. Is he still here? or Shomo Saha, or um, yes, Arjun. Go ahead. I've unmuted sir, you. Yeah, go ahead. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Sir, in the picture of M51 and M52, why the outer side of the galactic spiral arms are look bluish? Uh, is there any reason uh, for that, uh, that the newborn stars are much greater in that portion? And if yes, then why? Um, are you talking about, um, let's see, are you talking about uh, these ones here? I mean, yes, this, if you want. here are the stars yes, that are being pulled out as a, as, as a result of the interactions. There is no evidence that these are predominantly bluer. But the blue stars that you see in the spiral arms, this is where in the previous question Himadri asked that where is the molecular clouds? And that's where the molecular clouds are. You see, and that's where all the stars are being formed. These, these blue things are the young stars, right? Okay, so. blue, blue stars are young stars. They are the hotter stars, black body. They are the hotter stars. They're 20,000 degrees as opposed to 6,000 degrees of our sun. So all these, and, and they are predominantly in these spiral perturbations in the, in the galaxy. These are perturbations, as you know, and, and the spiral perturbation causes these molecular clouds to, to um, collapse and form stars. A lot of these are blue stars and they, they are in the disk of the galaxy. In the outer parts of the galaxy, you, form, you, you find very few, um, very few uh, young stars. And so they're mostly in the disk of the galaxy. You can see this, for example, in, in this one, the, the Stefan's Quintet as well. Okay. Okay, thank you. Shomo Saha. Shomo? Hello, sir. Yes, go ahead. You must go ahead. Yeah, sir. Uh, my question is, uh, how do we, how do we put that numbers? I mean, that fit to to the specific to the such a galaxies. I mean, how do we recognize such galaxies with these numbers? 
What, what number are you talking uh, about? Because there, which number are you talking because, about? Because, uh, sir, there are so many. Yeah, M51, M52. I mean, the galaxy numbers. How do you put them with this numbering? Oh, the name of the galaxy. Oh, those are uh, that's historical. Uh, that yeah. is uh, actually quite a trivial issue. Um, uh, you can call any numbers you want. M51, M52 came from the Messier catalog from the 1780s. Uh, Messier was a French astronomer who, uh, through his small telescope, cataloged a number of uh, fuzzy objects in the universe. The nebulae I talked about in my very first lecture. And he didn't even know they were galaxies. They called, he called them M51 and M52. There are 110 um, such systems in his um, uh, catalog, one M1, M2, M3, etc. M31, for example, is the Andromeda galaxy. Yeah. And so these are nearby objects that you can see through a small telescope. And, and uh, even now, amateur astronomers, if you have a telescope, you go to a roof, you can actually from even um, from just outside the city, you can see through a small telescope, you can find these galaxies, right? So now, yes, yes. So th these were M51. Later on, somebody else made another catalog and they started numbering one, two, three, four. So sometimes you find that the uh, 51th galaxy, a uh, 51th object in this catalog is the same as the 1,343 number in that, et cetera, et cetera. So that, okay. that numbering is random. That is nothing to do with uh, uh, you know, the property of a galaxy or anything. Often galaxies that are next to each other were discovered together, so they were given names 51 and 52. Okay, great. So um, uh, there's a question from uh, Gitanjali Sethi, who says that her mic is not working. So, um, uh, but she has asked some questions in the chat box. So I'm going to articulate uh, one of the questions that she has asked. And so um, she's asking, what causes the collapse in star formation in the lone stars that are not bound in galaxies, found in the intergalactic regions? A very, very good question. And Gitanjali, I think what we think is that those stars are not mostly formed there because stars do require, as you, as you say, perturbations for... Uh, Gitanjali, can you actually, is your mic working? Did you want to ask the question yourself? Okay, I'm just um, asking for you anyway. So those, um, those stars, stars do require some kind of a perturbation to make them collapse and, and, um, and, and, and form. And uh, we believe that most of these stars would have been formed in the disk of the galaxy in these regions of spiral perturbations or um, due to the perturbations in the disk itself. And the stars that you see outside out here are, um, are stars that have been pulled out after they have formed. Um, where the stars are forming in the regions in between the galaxies um, is not very well known. And we don't know of mechanisms that unless there are uh, interactions between stars themselves, uh, long range interactions uh, that on protostars themselves that can cause protostars to collapse. Um, I haven't read much research on, on such things happening. People believe that these stars were formed, and that is why most of the stars that you see outside the galaxies are oldish stars, they're redder stars, not really young stars. If we do find lone blue young stars roaming around in between galaxies, that would be a great puzzle, and we'll have to solve it. Okay, so that's, that's Gitanjali's question. Um, are there any other questions that anybody wants to ask? Um, I might have another five minutes or so. Uh, you can raise your hand. There's a question uh, here um, from Satwik Lakka Raju, who has asked in the chat box a question saying, um, what kind of experiments are being done to define dark matter? Are there any particular particles that define dark matter? Very, very good question. This is a subject of its own. And there's in fact a whole branch of physics called astroparticle physics, where people have been um, talking about uh, doing experiments from 1970s, 80s uh, to find di directly dark matter particles. We now know that these dark matter particles cannot be baryonic because the amount of dark matter that there is in the universe is much more than the number of quarks we think came out of the Big, uh, big Bang. And so they have to be non-baryonic and non-baryonic. And clearly in the various experiments that have been done by setting up, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
matter that uh, such particles might uh, interact with in large quantities um, and in mines, for example, or setting up large uh, labs with, uh, um, with uh, uh, particles uh, that might interact with these dark matter particles. We know that they, they, these dark matter particles don't interact very closely with any of the particles that we have, um, the baryonic particles. And so we also think that these are uncharged um, um, particles, which um, don't interact with us uh, very easily. These are, that is why these are called WIMPs, weakly interactive massive particles. They might be supersymmetric particles that uh, particle physicists think about, uh, uh, have theorized about. Um, you can look up um, on the web uh, as to dark matter candidates. You'll find axions, you'll find uh, massive neutrinos, you'll find many particles that have the name enos at the, at the end. There are many uh, theoretically predicted particles that could uh, be created in the early universe in the process of nucleosynthesis or in the process of when the universe was going through the phase transition between radiation dominated universe to mass dominated universe. Or even earlier on in the very, very early universe when the universe was uh, very hot, such particles could have been created, but none have been detected because they are not, they don't interact with baryons. And so all our experiments are made up with baryons. So it's very difficult um, to, um, uh, to find them. Uh, I will, uh, uh, Mind Kumar tells me, please provide references. When I put up the, um, the slides on the wiki, uh, where a lot of the slides are being put on, I will add uh, some references. But these, are, these references are easily Googleable. You can find. I'll, I'll give you some books and links to find from. OK, um, and then finally, um, uh, I don't see any other questions here. Um, I haven't had uh, many questions that are outstanding from the YouTube feed. I, my colleagues there have answered uh, most of the questions. Um, I don't know whether, Divya, uh, you had any questions coming from the, um, 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 from the YouTube feed that I had to address that haven't been answered there. Um, Gitanjali, did you have any other question that uh, you had your hand up for? I know that your microphone was not working. If not, um, thank you very much for today. And I am going to uh, sign off today. Um, and uh, I'll come back again uh, on Thursday morning, uh, continuing the story of clusters and uh, superclusters and groups of galaxies.